Hello hackers! I'm Jan, welcome to Pwn College. Today we're going to be talking about memory as part of our assembly crash course. So, uh, we talked about data. We talked about registers where we uh, hold data to uh, quickly work on it. Now, there's a very few amount, a very few registers, right? Um, because they're expensive, they need to be right next to the CPU so the CPU can directly access them. They need to be inside the CPU and uh, there's just not a lot of space in there. It's very, very cramped. So uh, every once in a while, when we have too much stuff going on, too much data, we need to put it in memory, right? Now, memory is a big vault of data, like a safety deposit box vault in a bank where we just go and we put the data into a numbered slot. All right, remember our uh, crazy CPU architecture from kind of that, that, that first lecture? Um, the, uh, uh, we're, we're talking about this right here. Now, how does a CPU get at data? It's kind of outside the scope of this class, but basically um, data, when it is needed, when it's requested by the CPU, goes over some crazy sort of bridge um, into a one level of caching, goes from that cache into another level of caching, and then goes from that cache into the registers and is then used directly by the control unit or the arithmetic unit of the CPU. Uh, this takes time and so of course you know we want to work on registers as much as possible and then go to data when we need and we do I mean you, you have like I don't remember very few registers but uh, there's a lot of data to cover like 16 register general purpose registers and a bunch of other ones um, but we might need terabytes of cat videos that we need to watch all right let's talk about memory so from a process perspective your memory uses your process uses memory for everything. It uses memory to store and load registers. It uses memory actually to read data from the disk, right, to the disk, and then all like shunting data around memory. The network card, the video card, there's a lot of memory, and there's just too much memory to add to name every location. Um, there's enough registers to name every register, RAX, RBX, RCX, etc., but there is too much memory to do so. So, Memory has numbers. It's similar as like a university is too big that to track everyone by name, they give everyone a user, uh, a student ID um, or an employee ID. You know, memory has these numerical identifiers. Now, memory is basically addressed linearly from zero to a very, very high number. It used to be more or less the word width of the architecture. Now it's actually uh, something, well, that's actually not, anyways. Now it is uh, from, it's actually not from zero. It's, uh, there's a lot of security issues that happen if you can access memory at zero, then if you accidentally leave an address initialized to zero, bad stuff can happen. But um, it goes to two to the 47th for um, your uh, process memory. And then for your, comp for your kernel memory, for your operating system, uh, part of your process is memory. It goes from 2 to the 48th, sorry, 2 to the 47th minus 1, and then for your process memory, it goes from 2 to the 47th all the way to 2 to the 48th minus 1. Anyways, this is an enormous amount of memory. That's tw 127 terabytes of addressable RAM, right? You can have RAM kind of live anywhere in here. Uh, that, that, that there's memory. No one has that much RAM. I, I don't even think you can spin up a massive cloud machine for insane amounts of money with that much RAM. Um, it's a lot of RAM. And, and uh, of course, I forgot to mention each of these, each location, each numbered location represents one byte of memory, eight bits. All right. So uh, how can you have this much memory addresses if you have not this much RAM? Well, not all of your memory is real. In fact, we use something called virtual memory. We learn a lot about virtual memory later in the uh, in, in the in the later module when you talk about kernel security. You'll understand exactly how it works. It's super cool. But we have 
every process has its virtual memory space and it starts out just partially filled. It's uh, the process's program data is gonna go somewhere. Um, somewhere else is gonna be its, its uh, you know, dynamically allocated memory, the, the heap. Somewhere else is gonna be some library code. The stack, uh, other operating system helper regions, there's a bunch of stuff in your your process can request more memory to be mapped in at any time, right? Um, and this is basically uh, uh, the view of memory of your process. And it just says, hey, I want memory at, at this region, or at this address, and then it grabs it. So first, let's talk about the stack, and then we'll talk about how to move values between registers and memory. Well, I mean, the stack is one such way. Um, the stack is a region of memory that when your process starts up, and hopefully you recall our whole lecture series about process uh, life cycle, when a process starts up, a space in memory is created called the stack. And it is at some address. And that address is usually something absurd, like uh, whatever, we'll talk about it in a second. Um, when you want to store a register or, or a value in memory on the stack for temporary storage, you can push it. You push things onto the stack and then you pop them right back off the stack, right? So here I push three values. I push, I write cool cats into RAX and then I push cool cats and then I push boba cafe, push boba cafe and I push RAX push RAX, and then later I can pop them right back off in reverse order. And so when I pop the top value of this, now these are values, they have no identity, don't, they maintain no identity back to the original register in which they were stored or whatever. They're just ones and zeros pushed onto the stack. Um, each entry on the stack is the bit width of the architecture. Each entry is 64 bits, even if I pushed a 32-bit number, it just zero pads it. Um, now, even on 64-bit CPUs, as it says here, you or an x86 specifically, you can only push 32-bit numbers. There's just no instruction to push a 64-bit number directly. It's very infuriating. Um, you have to do this. You have to write it to a register and then push it. Um, they just didn't make an instruction for it, which I think it's dumb, but whatever. I didn't make AMD 64 and they probably had good reasons and probably no one needs this anyways. All right, except for like assembly teachers. So point is we have values on the stack, we can pop them off and they are popped in reverse order. You, you can imagine, in fact, the stack should be imagined as like a stack of video games. You push onto the stack, push onto the stack, push onto the stack, then you pop off the stack in reverse order. Now, since the stack lives in a continuous memory space and I like to read from left to right, I write it out from left to right. And we'll talk about why I put stuff on the right of it in a second. Okay, um, so I pushed um, RAX, the value in that, cool cats. Of course, like move, the, the value stays also in the register. Now it's in two places. Then I pushed Boba Cafe. Then I pushed cool cats again. This is my stack. When I pop into RBX, it's going to take cool cats. It's going to take it off the stack. Actually, fun fact, it remains on the stack. We just redefined where the stack ends, but the bytes are still there if you wanted to get at them. Um, and then we write the value that was there into RBX. All right, so in here, RBX becomes cool cats. And then when we pop into our CX, our CX becomes Boba Cafe. It's that simple. Push, pop, no problem. The stack, very simple. <clears throat> Let's talk about addressing. Now, the stack is, in, is somewhere in memory at an address. That address is typically hex 7F followed by a bunch of garbage because uh, it's typically randomly located. Why is it uh, there? at 7F specifically, there's no real reason. You could place the stack anywhere, really. The stack is in very high parts of memory because historically, and here's a crazy thing, 
it grows backwards. It grows toward smaller memory addresses. As you push onto the stack, if RSP starts out at this crazy address ending in hex 050, and it has cool cats on it, and we push Boba Cafe, cool cats was at address 050, Boba Cafe now lives at address 048, which coincidentally is the new top of the stack as it's termed, really the left part side of the stack, and the address of the stack in the register that stores the address of the stack uh, is, uh, is decreased by eight. When you push onto the stack, the register is decreased by eight because the stack grows to the left toward the beginning of memory. Um, and I'm, my video may be mirrored, by the way. I should really fix that, that's dumb. All right, the more we, uh, when we pop, then we take that value, we write that into RCX, and then we fix up the stack pointer again so that it is pointing to, that, that it holds the address ending in 050, what we started before we pushed. All right, TLDR, push, subtracts eight from RSP, pop, uh, adds eight to RSP after writing and reading the data respectively. All right, you can of course access memory using its addresses directly. Just be careful, make sure that there's something there to access. Again, memory is virtual, it might not exist. When you try to access it, your program will crash. In fact, if you run this, it definitely crashed. But this basically says, hey, take this address, one, two, three, four, five hexadecimal, move it into RAX, then use it as a memory address. Look at the memory, and that's what these brackets use. Uh, mean the brackets mean hey there's this is a memory address look at the data in memory and read it into RBX RBX is a 64-bit register so it will read 64 bits 8 bytes from RBX memory is stores a byte at a time so it does make sense to read like three bytes uh, three bits of memory you read uh, memory several bytes at a time or one byte at a time so this will read eight bytes into RBX and the eight bytes will start from one, two, three, four, five. All right, this will store 64 bits, eight bytes, that are in RAX, no, sorry, in RBX, whatever they were, into the memory space starting at the address 133337, right? So in the same way as the read, again, information data flows to the, uh, with the mirror, to the left, um, we take the memory in REX and here we read it into RBX, we load it. This takes the data in RBX and we store it into the memory addressed by RAX. Now, it's the value here that's important. If this value was in RCX and we had RCX here, it would point to the same memory. Now, I keep using the word point to an address in a register of a given memory address means that that register points to that memory address saying, ha, 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 there it is, there it is. That's where we're gonna write. That's where we're gonna read. That's it, that's all the pointer means. Okay, now we have uh, a um, interesting case where we can also uh, sorry. Pointer means that uh, uh, the, there's an address in a register that references some memory location. Well, hey, RSP is the really extended stack pointer. RSP, as we talked about just now, holds the address of the stack. You can also access it directly. Nothing special about this. This is equivalent to a push. Uh, actually, this is a, a lie. This should be eight. My bad. Um, let me pause the recording and fix that because that should be correct. All right, we're back. So now it's correct. Um, subtracting eight from RSP and then plopping whatever value you wanted to push, this is equivalent to push. Pretty cool. All right, and remember, each memory location contains one byte. And so if you write 
an 8 byte value, a 64 bit value to 133337, you will write 133337, that memory location, you will write the next byte to 133338, uh, and the 9, 10, uh, and this is an embarrassing error because this is not right <laughs> again. All right, let me fix that. All right, and now it's fixed. Okay, sorry, I had this in. I had a uh, hex fail. Anyways, it'll write the eight bytes from one two three 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 seven to one three 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 F. Pretty cool. Okay, um, now uh, let's talk about controlling those write sizes. You can absolutely control those write sizes. Um, you can use partial. Uh, let me move myself here. You can use partial registers. Very uh, easy to write fewer bytes. So this instruction will load, or this these two instructions will load eight bytes from the memory location starting at one, two, three, four, five into RBX, and then write eight bytes, or write four of those bytes from EBX into the memory location starting at 133337. Right? EBX is a four byte long, 32 bit long register. When you write from EBX, you will write those four bytes. Super straightforward, right? Um, this stores eight bits, just one byte, AH. Just that, that, that partial register. All right. Um, or oh, sorry, it'll load Man, this is full of mistakes. I apologize. One second. All right. Apologize about that. Um, this will load eight bits from the address one, two, three, four, five hex to BH. Just eight bits because BH is an eight bit wide register. Just one byte load. All right. Don't forget if you load into EAX, EBX, etc., etc., you will zero out the top. 32 bits. You will forget and it'll screw you up and it's not fun. Okay, so now we're talking about all of these sized writes. Well, they are really weird. Um, on x86, as long as, as, as well as most modern operating systems, <laughs> data is stored backwards byte wise in something called little endian. So here we have cool cats being set to REX, cool cats, very awesome. We uh, write cool cats into uh, hex one uh, ten thousand. This uh, address, it ends up backwards. It's written in little endian. The first byte, if we wanted to read it, would end up with seventy five. That's th. Then cat, the next byte backwards, then all, o one, and then co. Cool cats gets flipped around. Anytime you do a multiple byte write between registers and memory, your data gets flipped. That's the only time. Why does this happen? It happens for historical reasons that are, are, are rooted in, in a, a, a something that makes sense. So Intel created the 8008 processor, an, an ancient, ancient processor, predecessor to everything else in 1972. Not everything else, but all the other Intel stuff. They created it for a company called DataPoint. And to be compatible with DataPoint's uh, in existing processes, they used the same endianness. And, and, and it's, it is clever. If you wanted to add consider doing like in elementary school long addition you write out a number you write it out another number and you add and you start on the right and you work to the left you start at the least significant digits and you work toward the most significant digits and the reason you do that is as you add that things if the result of your addition on the column is greater than 10 you carry a one right and then you keep doing that and it turns out that's easier to do, it's only possible to do if you start from 
the least significant and move upwards. So if you are going to process data and add large numbers, it makes sense. You start, you store them backwards in memory and you start with the least significant bytes and you go onwards. Historically, according to Wikipedia, which is where I tracked this down to, that's why Intel went with Little Endian for 8008 for multi-byte values and every step of the evolution since then up to modern x86 has at least kept compatibility with its direct pre predecessor. Um, and so there's some level of compatibility, including the memory endings. Now there's other uh, benefits of, of little endian uh, data, et cetera, et cetera, but, but I, it's, it's a choice that is made and that's the choice we live in. Um, so memory is going to be stored Data is going to be stored backwards in memory. Now, caveats, again, this only happens, uh, this probably isn't true globally, but whatever. Typically, this only happens when storing and loading multiple bytes between registers and memory at a time, right? It only happens on the byte level. Just the bytes get flipped backwards. The individual bits in the bytes stay intact. So CO here is CO here. You don't flip the bits. That's a very, very common thing that people do. Um, and pushes and pops, exactly the same. A push will write eight bytes and it will write them in reverse. Awesome. Um, and, and people often confuse that because the stack is already kind of growing uh, kind of in reverse as to what you'd expect. It's going towards smaller amounts of memory smaller addresses um and so people are like, yeah, yeah but like but no it's going to smaller air and memory and things get pushed backwards okay cool like any other memory access all right that's end this let's talk about address calculation well it's uh assembly or really the x86 architecture in binary and so very similarly represented assembly allows you to do address calculations so uh, it's useful for like accessing complex structures, um, lists of data, et cetera, et cetera. Here we uh, use RAX as an index into the stack eight bytes at a time. So uh, first we set it to zero. This is the data right at the stack pointer. We set it to one. This is the next entry. And we can continue commenting it, right? And so on. Um, you can figure out if your stack calculations are correct or if you just really want to get a memory address for something else um, by using the load effective address instruction, LIA. Um, load effective address allows you to specify that same operation. This one I, for some reason, put a plus five because presumably that's a bug. To load it in there and then you can inspect it and do whatever you want with it and pass it around to functions and and and, and it's all great fun um, now uh, address calculation has limits there's you can't just do arbitrary arithmetic in it it needs to be encoded into a very limited instruction on the cpu you basically take register plus a register times either two or four or eight plus a value that's all you get but it's typically good enough. All right. Now, one of the very cool things while we're talking about address calculations that uh, AMD64 did is introduce RIP relative addressing. Recall that RIP is the instruction pointer. It points to the next instruction that will be executed. Um, and we'll talk more about RIP when we talk about how to change control flow. Load effective address, you can't move data out of the instruction pointer directly. You can't just say, hey, what's the, the address of the next instruction? It just isn't something the move instruction does. It just wasn't supported. Load effective address is able to access the instruction pointer on 64-bit x86. And so when you want to know, hey, what's the address of the next instruction, you can do this and you can load it into RAX. You can also do address, uh, arbitrary address operations with indexing, well, exactly what we did in the previous uh, page, multiplying by eight, by two, whatever. 
Also, AMD in their infinite wisdom when they designed AMD 64 out of x86 and gave us this 64-bit architecture that's awesome, allowed us also to directly access memory offset from the instruction. Now, even writing there, right? Now, there's a caveat here, as you will learn in uh, the shell coding module, memory isn't typically uh, 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 memory that holds code isn't typically able to be written to, but if it can, it can, or you can offset it from the code. In fact, this rip relative addressing enables, um, is a, a super useful when you embed data around your code, which every modern binary does uh, explicitly. Uh, an ELF file, including its data and its code is actually loaded into memory as a big chunk. <coughs> and the fact that we can do rip relative addressing because we know the size of the file, we know where relative to the code the data is, you can now get at the data, right? And this enables cool security features like being able to put that ad, that file anywhere in memory at random and still have it function because it doesn't rely on a specific address to be on. All accesses are relative to where it's executing. Very cool and a uh, uh, powers um, modern uh, security features. Cool, so that's rip relative addressing. Um, now, you can write immediate values to memory, but you must specify their size, right? Uh, because the CPU doesn't know how big hex 1337 is. It knows, it could potentially know, the assembler, actually not the CPU, the assembler doesn't know what instruction to output, what to tell the CPU to do. Uh, it could is it telling the CPU to write 00001337? Or is it telling, that's four bytes, or is it telling the CPU to write two bytes, 1337? Two different instructions, right? Or two different representations in binary. Um, and so you can specify a size. You can say, hey, REX is currently a double word pointer. It's pointing to a double word, so write four bytes. Um, depending on your assembler, it might want D word instead of D word pointer uh, or, or Q word uh, um, or word. That's how these work. Um, and I actually have that later in the in the shell coding because that's where it becomes a little more relevant. Um, all right. And finally, um, the stack isn't the only memory region. There are other memory regions that we'll learn about later. Um, or I guess the stack or your binary code, which is uh, accessible with rip relative addressing. The stack is accessible with push pop and addressing into RSP. Well, there are other memory regions um, and you can also allocate uh, other memory regions in your program. Eh, we'll talk about that later. Hopefully you know a lot about memory. Uh, see you next time.